All right, I think the stream is on. So if anybody is tuned in, this is class number two of care and feeding of your daily practice, working with the unbounded view. Uh, and we've got a couple of stragglers coming in here at KCC, so we won't get started for a minute or two. Uh, but I'll take the opportunity to go ahead and introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Sally Allworth. This is my husband, Jeff Allworth, and we are not formally on the teaching staff here at KCC, but we're longtime students and we're really uh, kind of peer facilitators of this session. I keep waiting to hear Joe come through the door. Yeah, he may not be making it. We can welcome if he comes. Is this picking up my voice? It is. Sounds good. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and start with a couple of minutes of shamatha to help us settle into this place we've arrived at. Uh, and we're using a particular refuge in bodhicitta prayer for this class. So if you're at home and you don't have it, uh, just hold the meaning of the refuge in Bodhicitta. Until full <coughs> enlightenment, I take I refuge in the Buddha, the, Buddha, the Dharma, and the, and the Sangha through, through the practice of generosity, generosity patience, and the, the other perfections. perfections. May I awake for the sake of all beings. beings. Until full enlightenment, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the practice of generosity, patience, and the other perfections, may I awake for the sake of all beings. Until full enlightenment, I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the practice of generosity, patience, and the other perfections, may I awake for the sake of all beings. So, oh, I, I switched this so I was the next person because you have a, you're doing a lot today. All right. Uh, <laughs> when I print, when we print these out, we have our own separate sheets that tell us who do, <laughs> does what. But I switched something, and Sally didn't know about it. Um, since there are some new folks here, why don't we go around the room and introduce ourselves, 
And I want to let you guys know that Sally and I can't see any face from about there. So like the middle five of you are completely um, black. Uh, it's okay. Just just so people know. <laughs> um, you are luminous tonight. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that helps a little. That does. Ah. Uh, that definitely helps. Thank you, Linda. So that's Sally, as she said, and I'm Jeff. And um, and also, we need to ask you when you're speaking to please use this microphone in the center so that the folks at home can also hear. I'm Cynthia. Sylvia. Linda. Phil. Peter. Joe. I'm Bjorn. Susan. Mary Linda. Mark. We have perfect gender parity. Oh, wow, that's unusual. It's true. How are we going to break ties? Maybe the streamers are not mixed up. More diverse. Yeah. All right, now you're up. No, I'm not. Oh, you're right. My next thing's <laughs> mine, too. Well, the trains are really rolling on, on schedule right today. So, uh, for those of you who were here last week, we had a carrying practice, um, which kind of worked on some of the themes we touched on in the last class. And that was uh, hold all beings as the Buddha. Uh, and we thought we'd start out this uh, first part of the session and kind of reflect how that went. So how did that go? <laughs> it's true. Those of you who were here yesterday morning, I, uh, I asked a question during the Q&A about meeting some resistance in uh, I I tried working with this caring practice uh, in the most difficult situation, personal situation in my life, and I just ran smack into the cement wall of my own resistance of just really feeling like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was really intriguing to look at that resistance and see that the story in my mind was, if I hold this person as the Buddha, uh, they win and I lose, uh, which is, of course, very fishy. Uh, <laughs> but it was super solid. Like, that was the actual reality of trying to carry the practice for me. And, and the truth was, uh, every day that I knew I was going to see this person, I thought, I'm going to do this when I see them. And most of the time, I couldn't even remember to try. Like I would just get carried away with the intensity of the situation. Uh, and then when I, it, there were some moments where I was actually able to, uh, to do it, to try to do it uh, in the flow of the day. But mostly I just kept running into this thing. Of, it's really hard. I don't really want to do this with this person. Please. So Mark has the mic. We had a great opportunity to practice the following morning, Tuesday morning. We both went to the dentist to have um, teeth ground down for crowns. And it was really fun. So we, we, without talking ahead of time about it, when we both done, we said, um, it's nice having the Buddha be your dentist, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and the hygienist. And it was really fun to, to play with that because it's still grinding you. They still shoot you full of Novocaine or whatever. But it made it different, you know. I felt sort of differently about it and held it differently, mm -hmm. um, and it was perfectly um, all right. And then 
with that as a start, it, was, it sort of rolled playfully along, you know, from that, from people driving cars and people on the street and in stores. And it's a, really a nice, it lightened up the daily life. And, um, um, and so having that as a point of view, I found it to be very useful. <laughs> I, I look at the YouTube and I had only two days to practice and I went in an intellectual way of uh, thinking that following the example of the diamond and the mud that you mentioned mm. Uh, that when we are born, we are the diamond, and condition is the confusion, the mud. Then I decided to see everybody as a baby, just <laughs> born, and then I could see that um, little Buddha <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> inside. That's my It's interesting to approach just anybody as your teacher and just to be there expecting a teaching, you know, and I'm sure they thought I was just crazy <laughs> looking at them like this in the gym and in Fred Meyer and so forth. But I mean, there's usually some kind of teaching there. Was, that was a fascinating experience. Well, I <clears throat> forgot to do it after a while, but uh, early in the week, uh, I got a nuisance call, and as I fairly often do, I just hung up on the person, and then thinking about that person as a Buddha, <laughs> I thought, I wouldn't do that. I would say, thank you, I'm not interested, or something like that. So that was uh, worthwhile. and. <clears throat> I needed to talk to a tech support person, and I made an intentional effort to be particularly appreciative for that contact. And I felt as if I had a uh, separation difficulty with my nephew, and I made an effort to reach out to him and heal whatever real or imagined uh, distance there was between us. And then because I don't see a lot of people, it just sort of drifted away after that. There's a prayer from um, another place. <laughs> and the prayer is, God, this is a sick person. Let me know how to be helpful to them. Save me from being angry and afraid. Thy will be done. So with that prayer that I heard about 25 years ago, I and the information that came on either side of that, I've never really thought of anybody as being unobscured. That m myself and all of the people around me are obscured. And the Buddha nature in all of us is obscured. So when somebody is particularly irritating and awful, I cannot like their behavior. I cannot want to be close to that. But I do recognize that even a serial killer has Buddha nature. And the only thing that that, that very deluded and obscured person was trying to do was to find comfort and happiness. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that I find comfort and happiness by blinking my eyes so that they don't burn. Mm -hmm. That there are all of these things that go on in me all the time that I have no control over that's doing to, to make myself comfortable. And a person that gets really angry is doing that because they think that that will make them happy. So um, I, I carried that 
not as the Buddha, but as Buddha nature inside of everyone. Mm. And then inside of all the dogs we met at the dog park and all the little ants that are invading my house and <laughs> all the trees and you know, I could spread that out pretty wide to say mm -hmm. everything, everything, every atom and molecule has Buddha nature, but some of it is obscured and I may not like it. <clears throat> One of the reasons we did this was to, it's in the context of the, the unbounded view, and I wondered if um, people had the experience of um, feeling that by thinking of other people as the Buddha or holding that possibility open, whether there was any kind of shift in the way you, re you regarded the larger world. Um, I, I, and I, for me, that was, that was a big thing. Um, I noticed a lot of, uh, we get into habits. Um, there's, Michael used to talk a lot about reactivity how we would react to what people said. And uh, so much of my experience with other people is just acting out of this kind of reactive and not necessarily like a conf horribly you know, confused reactive state, but just uh, there's a way in which nothing ever interrupts that. So thinking about somebody as the Buddha kind of shifts all of that for me when I, and, and it is challenging to remember, and like Peter, uh, okay, the further we got from Monday, the less often I actually remembered. <laughs> um, our, our shamatha is tested in this practice as well. But anyway, I just wondered if that was an experience others had too. In regarding all beings as the Buddha, I was aware of how I can be easily disrespectful of people mm. because I would never be disrespectful to the Buddha. But I could see that shift. You know, oh, I'm treating this person with more respect. Gee, why don't I always? Um, but the other thing that was really clear was, and maybe this is just because I have you know, a teenage son who has a lot of uh, strong emotions right now, and a lot of them are very painful and very um, oftentimes directed at me. I just saw how much, you know, when you think of Buddha as sort of a Chenrezig-like figure, how much the Buddha would take on the suffering for relieving the rest of us in some manner. Mm -hmm. And so to look at my son and think, not, you know, oh, I'm angry at you because you are suffering, but instead to flip it and say, oh, he's, he's taking on all this anger because he's trying to help me. That's so precious. I don't think it's really what he's doing, but I tried it, you know? <laughs> Yeah, we, it interrupts that process of thinking we know what they're doing, though, too, right? <laughs> so at least it makes us think, I don't actually know what he's thinking. That can be helpful. Hmm. That's part of my reactivity, as I always just, you know, it's like, you said this thing. I noticed a lot of my own territory, that reactivity was uh, often. Yeah, I do most, I work at home, and I do most of my work uh, with other people through the computer interface. Um, and when I thought of somebody as, um, you know, somebody who doesn't know as much as I do, or is, you know, whatever, uh, just an, an, irrit an irritating email that I have to deal with, it was, I had this kind of mental image of what they were thinking, and then when I thought of them as the Buddha, I kind of just like, well, maybe they're not that way. So I had sort of the opposite experience of the forgetting to do it over time. Um, I realized on Tuesday, I was like, 
what was our homework again? <laughs> so I, I asked Jeff on Wednesday, and then I was like, oh, that's right. So between Wednesday and now, I actually really made an intention to practice it every day. And um, I kind of relate to what you said, Sally, about it. Like, I, I will say that it's, you know, obviously not the first time I've heard that teaching and suggestion and, and, and I have definitely found it to be probably one of the most valuable exercises that I could possibly do and uh, one of the most life-changing ones day to day if I can remember to do it but also one of the hardest for sure one of the hardest kind of Buddhist practices or exercises but um, it, it was a little bit different it wasn't quite so much I was thinking uh, if I were to do it that they would win and I had resistance to that it was it was uh, similar but mine was like I just became aware of how much I feel that I am at war with certain people and um, that uh, I I feel like um, that they don't deserve for me to not be at war with them, that they, that they, you know, I'm a nice guy and I try to be a decent person. So if I'm at war with you, you know, you're, you're pretty villainous. You very nice. And, um, and so I, I feel like kind of letting my guard down um, is really hard. You know, like I've tried to practice this with Trump, for example, many, many times. And I try <laughs> to practice Tonglan for Trump and it's so hard, so hard. Cause I think, you know, we gotta fight. You know, I can't be like imagining this guy's the Buddha. I gotta fight this guy. I can't. I wouldn't fight the Buddha, but I gotta fight. We gotta fight this guy and you know a few other guys and gals. And so it is really hard, but it, it does make me aware of like just how much of a non-compassionate warrior <laughs> <laughs> I am with some folks. Uh, you know, including some people that are actually in my my, my actual physical day-to-day -day life. Uh, but yeah, it, it's very valuable, and I, I tried hard, and it was helpful. It's always helpful, but it's very, very, very hard. Yeah, yeah working with this myself, uh, you know, I had some flashes of um, just catching it in the moment, like, is this the cause of happiness for me? So clearly not. Like the, the resistance, running into that resistance and then thinking like, what am I holding on to here? This is not making me joyful. Uh, yeah, maybe I can make the other guy pay. Maybe, uh, maybe I feel like he doesn't deserve compassion from me, but I'm suffering. This is not, this is not the path to happiness. Um, I know, yeah, it's such a funny thing to even in the, the moment after being able to see that and experience that really clearly, to just feel how dug in I am. Like, I'm not going to do it. You can't make me do it. You can't make me go there. Um, and in those moments, I went back to uh, the contemplation we did last week of my own Buddha nature. It's like, okay, so clear, clearly there's trouble, there's trouble over here. Uh, and I'm having trouble relating to the purity over there. Can I at least see if I can relate to the purity here? Can I find the diamond? Can I find the gem? Um, and when I can do that, I have the experience you described of there just being a lightness, like, oh, like, I don't actually need anything else right in this moment. It's okay. It feels okay to let go of things a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I, I relate to what you're saying about how doesn't make me feel happy to be at war. It's, I think, I, I, I feel like I need to be, and I you know, can't be compassionate with this person because you know, it's important that we stand up against bad things, and yet it, it, I, I don't have, there's no happiness that comes from that. I don't walk away saying, yeah, boy, you know, I'm at war with that guy, and that makes me feel good. 
that doesn't, you know, that doesn't happen at all. Which seems like an insightful observation. <laughs> We don't want to force everyone to talk, but also want to leave space if anybody who hasn't spoken would like to. I hope at home folks who uh, are watching along had a chance to work with it and that it was productive. And we'll, we'll have a new one this week, so we'll try something out this time, a new one. So why don't we, let's go ahead and switch to the reading for this week, which came from Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and read it for the folks at home. That seemed to go over pretty well last week. Uh, but Jeff also brought copies. So this is an excerpt from a teaching called The Buddhist Understanding of Reality from Thich Nhat Hanh. Okay, you changed my mind. Uh, before I read it, I'll say, so our idea for this week uh, was that we wanted to talk about kind of an unbounded view of time, uh, which gets us into this whole idea of karma and rebirth. And uh, we actually really, really struggled finding a reading for this week uh, because the idea that time is essentially without beginning and that beings take rebirth again and again and again is so fundamental to the way the Tibetans see the world. It's so fundamental to the tradition that teachers almost never offer commentary on it, it seems like. We looked at tons of books, we spent a ton of time searching online, and we just kept running into these references like, well, uh, given that we all know that this is true, here's a detailed description of exactly how karma works, or ex you know, a debate about the seventh consciousness and the nature of the karmic seed that gets planted in the seventh consciousness. There was this sort of technical detail out, out there, but it, not a lot of talk about the basic idea, like, <laughs> Uh, which it, I think is an idea that a lot of Westerners really struggle with. It's not the one that a lot of us were raised with. Um, but fortunately, I came across this piece from Thich Nhat Hanh, and so I will go ahead and read that now. When we believe that consciousness is permanent and only the body perishes, that the soul continues and goes to heaven or hell, that is eternalism. A right view should transcend a view of, a view of eternalism. A permanent immortal soul is something that cannot be accepted either by good Buddhists or good scientists. But the opposite view, that after this body disintegrates, you disappear altogether, is another extreme, another wrong view, called nihilism. As a student of Buddhism, you are not caught in either of these views. There's only continued manifestation in different kinds of forms. <laughs> That is, rebirth, continuation, in the context of impermanence and no self. Good scientists see that nothing is born and nothing dies. Being a cloud. Suppose you are a cloud. You are made of tiny crystals of ice and water, and you are so light you can float. And maybe floating as a cloud, you encounter a block of hot air, so you become drops of water and fall as rain. You go down, you come up again, you go down, and you come up again. Transmigration, reincarnation, rebirth is always taking place in a cloud. And yet a cloud does not need to become rain in order to have a new life. A cloud has a new life every moment. 
rebirth continuation takes place with us in the same way. There is a lot of cloud in us and we continue to drink cloud every day. Birth and death are taking place in every moment of our daily life. We should not say, I will die in 20 years and 30 years. No, you are dying right in this moment and you are reborn right in this moment. Rebirth is happening in the here and the now, not in the future. So when someone asks you, what will happen to me when I die? Ask him or her, what happens to you in the here and now? If you know what happens in the here and now, you can answer the first question very easily. You are undergoing birth and death right now because mentally and physically you are uh, of a cinematographic nature. You are renewed in every instant and if you know how to do it, your renewal is beautiful. In every moment we produce thought, we produce speech, and we produce action. That action will have an effect on us and on the world. That is our karma. If you know how to handle your thinking, your speech, and your action, you'll be more beautiful. You don't have to wait until you die to see what happens to you. Look in the present moment, and you see that birth and death are going on in you at every moment, both in your body and in your consciousness. Every moment of our daily life, there is input and there is output. You breathe in, you take food, you have new ideas, new feelings, and things go out from you, like urine, air, and water. So the cosmos is renewing you, and you are releasing things to the cosmos. Birth and death does not wait. It is happening now, in the present moment. On the phenomenal level, there seem to be birth, death, being, and non-being, but ontologically, these notions cannot be applied to reality. Birth and death are just notions. The true nature of a cloud is the nature of no birth and no death. The science Lavoisier says there that nothing is born, nothing dies. He agrees completely with this teaching. A cloud manifests as a cloud. There is no birth of a cloud because before being a cloud, the cloud has been the tree, the ocean, the heat generated by the sun. To appear as a cloud is only a moment of continuation. And when a cloud becomes a river, that is not death, that is also continuation. We know that there is a way to continue beautifully, and that is to take care of our three aspects of karma, thinking, speaking, and acting. So what did you think of that? How do you relate to the boundedness of this life? Thank you. I have a theory that the whole universe is one being and is the creator. And the creator doesn't follow what the creation does, just experience what the creation does. As that, I feel like I am a cell of the creator itself. And this makes a lot of sense <laughs> to me <laughs> in that context because I, I think we are experiencing whatever it is, sending it back, the information goes to the creator and he creates new thing based on whatever all the beings that are alive send back to him or it or she. Um, then death is just that you experience this and you cannot experience anymore, then you disappear in this form and go into that you, we can call it under our language cons consciousness and bring all your knowledge there and then 
through whatever you learn in the many times that you experience, whatever you had to experience, you have the new sending out in a new form. I don't know if it makes any sense. I know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> and there might be a lot of holes in their description for people to understand what it is. But that's my, <coughs> my contribution. So this, this reading, when we constructed this class, we wanted everything to kind of interrelate. And um, just as a kind of recollection of what we talked about last week, um, it was the nature of mind, which has these three qualities of being um, clear, empty, empty and, un and, un and, un and un unimpeded. And a, a big part of that is that the nature of mind is not a part of the physical body. It doesn't have physical form. And so it connects with this kind of empty continuity uh, in a way that, well, anyway, that's what we were, those two <laughs> should relate to each other. I should not go any further. But yeah. the idea is that uh, we think about the form and then we think about time and the body and the continuity that we we feel like exists in our being, um, even though so often when we reflect back on ourselves as children or young people, it's hard to relate entirely to that as the same person. Yeah, and the, this tradition would say uh, there's no creator, there's no uh, intelligence that's guiding how things unfold. Uh, but also, given that we're not really qualified to talk about the ultimate nature of things, uh, it's not really our goal to provide a philosophical argument that this is the correct view of the universe um, or of our experience, but I think really to say, um, how does relating to this view uh, support our practice? How does it shift? our sense of what we're doing in our practice. <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I, I broke a wine glass in the uh, dishwasher. And I had this, this idea that the glass was always broken. This wasn't something new for this glass. It was broken the moment it was made. And uh, you know everything, I guess, that's put together is also coming apart all the time. And I mean, this is ripped, and I'm dead. It's a little harder to think of my, myself as being dead in some sense, or, or even unborn. But I mean, it's all there. I just, I have a lot of trouble going from the glass to me. Perhaps it's a reflection of my age, but um, <clears throat> I can certainly see myself dying. I really don't connect very well with the notion that I'm being born all the time, even that cells in me are being born, though perhaps in a, uh, with a better scientific understanding, I would see that that's the case. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> as my body disappoints me more and more, it's much easier to see myself as on the road to death and whatever follows that and not be able to see myself being reborn in any way. <laughs> yeah, but something new is coming as a result of this reading and this discussion, right? Otherwise, why bother? Curiosity. Okay, that's the verb. So I'm really glad you found this. That we, 
we read it. I really appreciated reading it um, this week. It's good to read it again now. Um, uh, I it sounds silly to say, but I, I I I really agree with it. Like um, this, the the category of reincarnation is the one, probably maybe only real part of of Buddhism as I understand it or don't really fully understand it that I struggle with. Mm. Um, I noticed that he only mentions the word reincarnation once, and that's up when he's talking about metaphorically what happens in the cloud, um, uh, transmigration, reincarnation, and rebirth is always taking place in the cloud. And then when he, um, when he defines karma, um, he says, in every moment we produce thought, we produce speech, we produce action, that action will have an effect on us and on our world, that is our karma. I, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the problem that the part that I don't understand, the part that I struggle with, and I should say that it doesn't make any difference because all the rest of the Buddhist teachings serve me so well, and I have so much challenge working with them that that this, the notion of trying to understand uh, transmigration and reincarnation and rebirth um, is at this point extraneous for me. I'm I have faith that. If I try to be a good Buddhist and then I drop dead and nothing ever happens other than I just fertilize the the wildflowers, it was a good deal to be a Buddhist. So it's it's okay. But I read this and I think, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. He he, you know, talks about the the, the French scientist and how this jives exactly with that, and all of that makes sense. And I I I just remember though that it, it and I know that Thich Nhat Hanh's not Tibetan so I don't know um, uh, if there's a little difference in thinking there but but you know I also know that in from what I understand in Tibetan Buddhism there there is it seems to me like uh, also another explanation of these things of transmigration reincarnation and rebirth and it, it is more it is more sort of like what he calls the eternalism. It is sort of like, like in you know most schools of Christianity and Islam, like you, you die and then you go to heaven or you go to hell and you know that there's you know purgatory is places you go and um, and it kind of seems like you know when I I hear the story of the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama and I see it depicted on film, it's like they're trying to find the kid that remembers his objects, you know, and it's like the the person that goes somewhere and oh yeah like if I went to heaven and my rice bowl was there I'm like oh yeah that's my rice bowl and, and it's sort of mm -hmm. like and um, you know the notion that Siddhartha Gautama it was his 108th reincarnation before he became enlightened and became Shakyamuni and and then also just uh, just teachings like I remember one time I met with with Julia I was having a really hard time with something and I, I hadn't talked to my father in 30 years and I said hey you know, I'm thinking about and doing this Buddhist thing, and maybe I should be compassionate and try to talk to my father. I haven't talked to him for 30 years, and she said, "Well, you know, that might be a good idea, and you don't have to." She goes, "If you don't work on it in this lifetime, between the two of you, you know, next lifetime around, you guys will just be in the same pickle, and you can maybe decide to work on it then if you want. <laughs> but you can work on it now; that might be better." And 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 on and on. I could give you know more examples, and so it seems like there's that that definition of reincarnation and karma where it is sort of, and I, I think I've heard the Dalai Lama say, yeah, maybe next time I might be a female or maybe I won't, maybe I won't reincarnate next time. Maybe I'll just go to Nirvana, you know? And it, it, so when I hear all this stuff, I, I just think, yeah, there is sort of like a teaching that it is sort of karma. Oh, and I remember one other thing. Last summer, one night, uh, in evening practice, there was a person that asked a question of the teacher that was there that night, and it was along the lines of the young person, and it was along the line, we we're kind of struggling with this, and it was along the lines of, you know, how could it be, you know, if everything's from karma, you know, how, 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 could, there, how could it be that, you know, all the, the folks that died in the Holocaust would, you know, deserve to die, and, and, and from what I understood what the teacher said, it was like, well, you know, maybe it's helpful to remember that something karmically caused that, and, and it was kind of the, you know, it was, the, it was that notion that, you know, that we struggle with, like, oh, well, it must be okay for that person to suffer as a child or something, because maybe somehow in the last life they brought on the karma, which, which I think is kind of what some Hindus think, I guess, I'm not sure, but, but it, it seems different than this. It seems different than this, and so I, I just, uh, 
I just, I, like I said, I don't, I don't understand how all of that and, and, and also what seems to be in place in Tibetan Buddhism necessarily jives with this much, much more sort of, I don't know what you'd call it, but like you know, uh, abstract and, and kind of scientific explanation. I think one of the things we wanted to, t to touch on when we uh, thought about the bounded nature of one lifetime is that if you begin to adopt the, the idea that it's not bounded by one lifetime, then what is it bounded by? How many lifetimes have we had and how many might we have? Um, I did some math. I think it was 80,000. If you lived 50 years since the beginning of the earth, you could have lived 80,000 lifetimes, something like that. Uh, even when you accept reincarnation, you know, that we're only on the, the 14th Dalai Lama, um, 17th Karmapa, so not, not actually a whole lot of lifetimes there. Um, I found it interesting to think about uh, the actual teaching that the Tibetans often talk about are, uh, you know, eons of lifetimes that we've lived, so much so that we could have all these relationships with different humans, which would take a lot of lifetimes to actually have a relationship with even all the humans that are here on Earth right now. Um, and all of this is not, I think, in a certain sense, uh, supposed to be taken literally. It is its own way of being, uh, placing the context on the unbounded view, that, that, that idea that um, our mind always wants to put a stop somewhere. So if we think about you know, many, many reincarnations, we think about you know, human, human uh, civilization goes back like 10,000 years or something, but human, human beings go back 100,000 years and bipeds go back, I don't know, whatever, a million years or something. I'm not a very good archaeologist, but um, in the context of this class, uh, I think it's interesting to try on the notion that we might live another 10,000 lives and see what that does to our practice. See how that how we relate to the things in our lifetimes, day to day, moment to moment, in this lifetime. Um, so, I just throw that out there. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to say one quick thing, um, kind of in dialogue with what Joe said. I mean, I I think where you went with it, Joe, this sense of like. Um, <coughs> I think it's easy for us in the West to end up with a kind of mechanistic sense of karma, like if you live a bad life, you'll be a dung beetle in your next life. Um, I, uh, we add a funny moral gloss to the idea of karma, that uh, if somebody is suffering now that they deserve it, that they did something horrible in the past, uh, and I think that's an addition, you know, I think that's not in the original tradition, uh, which my experience is having, having received a few teachings on this has much more of a quality of like, actions have consequences. We do things, other things will arise from them and some of them will be good and some of them will be not so good. Uh, and that they don't, that some things we can see that they unfold in a very short span. Uh, I drop the cup, the cup breaks. It's like action, reaction, very simple. Uh, but th this idea that uh, our manifestation throughout time unfolds in a much larger context holds open the possibility that things are blossoming and blooming and causes and conditions are coming together in ways that we could never predict. And they're about us, but they're also about our myriad connections to other beings. 
uh, and the relationships that we've had with them. And um, yeah, I'm, I, this is a really hard one to talk about. It's hard for me to talk about. Well, um, I think part of it is this unbounded thing too really gets to what Joe was talking about. Um, the idea that uh, the idea is that we're all these lifetimes, these cycles of rebirth, are uh, exist in the context of our failure to recognize the nature of our own mind, and in that process, <laughs> we continue to get reborn. Uh, and the, you know, many of the teachings talk about how uh, in the you know in many lifetimes that we've lived, we've experienced all these different experiences. We have been kings, and we have been um, you know, feudal serfs, and we have been subject to all kinds of trauma, and we have committed all kinds of trauma. And so the notion that uh, I think the way that Tibetans or the, the Buddhists deal with this, this, this kind of suffering is to say that, you know, in that bounded, unbounded view, we've all been in our holocausts. We've all been the victims of holocausts. Uh, of you know versions of different holocausts and we've all committed them we've all been the nazis and we've all been the jews and it's not that um it's not that the people who suffered that in you know in in poland in 1938 were any different than anybody else that's sort of the the way the tibetans unpack it is to say that we've all kind of been there and worse we've all done that which is a way for us to soften our heart towards other people I think it's important for us to to realize that we're that these notions of karma are human on one hand they can be scientifically documented on the other hand they are made up by human beings <laughs> and that a lot of us buy hook line and sinker the idea of a rigid form of karma and that my being has been reborn 100,000 times. And if one looks deeper than that, I think that Thich Nhat Hanh really has his finger on the, on the target there, on, on the pulse of it. I do not believe in reincarnation. I have been a Buddhist for a very long time. And I don't believe in the kind of karma that some people hold that um, I think most people here know that I have a very serious disease. I have Crohn's disease, which currently is in pretty much in remission. But I have a lot of additional things that have happened because of surgeries. And there are people who have told me or hold the belief that because I have this disease that I have done bad things in my life or in previous lives. Mm. And that is not true. <laughs> and it's not, I know it's not true because His Holiness the Karmapa explained it to me and it's not true. Mm. So I'd like to reference a book that talks about karma and rebirth and goes into it in great detail, and that's why I was looking at my phone. I wasn't really reading my email or you know, <laughs> looking something up on Amazon, although there's something I really want to buy, <laughs> you know, but I won't, I won't do that with it. <laughs> it's called Karma, What It Is, What It Isn't, Why It Matters by Trela um, Kamchan uh, Rinpoche. And if I can get my phone to twist it, um, it's the last book that he wrote before he died, very suddenly. And it is, uh, I studied the book uh, with another Buddhist group, a Nyingma group, and I have to tell you, my eyes were opened. Hmm. I mean, it was that, that some of the notions that are, they just, if you go into it deeper, it's just not there. So I recommend that book, and I think it would be oh so cool if we could have a study group on this and other books um, right. where we could delve into some of these more complex um, ideas hmm. and maybe realize that I'm, when I die, I'm made up of stardust, and when I die, I will return to that. And yes, that stardust probably encompasses all of those myriad things 
that have happened, but it's much more broad-minded. I think uh, it's much more unbounded mind than this rigid idea. And the Tibetans that I know don't really have that same, they, they hold it looser hmm. too. So, uh, and I'm not really coming up with the right words. I, I'm really sorry that I'm not, I hope you're able to read between what I'm saying and, and kind of grasp what I'm trying to say is that a lot of times the idea of, well, those, that person suffered and they'd, they'd done something bad in their lives is not necessarily true. Hmm. And that things arise because of causes and conditions, but that is so complex. Yeah. And that, so having an unbounded view and a broader mind and opening all of that up is really useful and later on, I'll probably think of things that, I'll probably think this was just kind of goofy, what I said, but <laughs> did I express something here that was useful? Okay. But anyway, the book is very, very good, and it really does go into in depth about what reincarnation and unbounded mind and who made up this stuff and why. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> All right, done. I like a lot of what, what Susan said. And I think it is the concept or how a lot of us or how pop culture views karma is a, like a human made up concept and you know, sports, automobile accidents, what happened there? Is it an accident? Well, no, it was their karma. They did something early, earlier life or early in this life and that's why they had a car accident or that's why they're sick now. And it's just, I think that shows a clear limitation of the human being, the human mind. Mm. You, know, you see something you don't understand. You don't connect, you don't, there's not a nice cause relationship. You drop a cup and it, it'll, it bound, it'll hit the floor. It may or may not break, but it'll hit the floor. Um, that's cause and effect. But you know, I, so if we're struggling for explanation, why did something happen? Why are some children, like there's some member of the Sangha whose nephew, uh, um, infant death syndrome. Right. And it's like, why does that happen? I mean, who the hell knows why it happens? Yeah. And does it, does it really matter? And I think it's, it's a good question practice to deal with. Mm -hmm. And in Karma, I heard recently um, an explanation that, um, you know, Karma is viewed in the Judeo Christian view as punishment. Something right. bad happens, something good happens, that's a reward for something. Right. And that's the story. It's a nice made-up story, um, but I, I like the explanation or the, op the way to view it as an opportunity hmm. instead of uh, a punishment or a reward. And something happens, and the question for you at that moment is, well, what do I do with this? How do I react to this? How do I respond to that? And one Buddhist teacher, in responding to some question from a student about um, about karma, so this person is like they're poor in the gutter, they're poor, they're diseased, whatever. Are, this, are they being punished for something? He goes, no, not necessarily. He could have been a very warm, compassionate, great teacher in his previous life, very high level of compassion, and he's been given a lesson to kick it up a notch, to be more compassionate, be more accepting of the harsh realities of the world. And so they go, wow, that's an interesting way to look at it. Mm -hmm is an opportunity, this is not, the question is what am I going to do with the, what happens to me or what I see in front of me? Mm -hmm. Is I don't need to look at, well look this happened, why did this happen? I don't think that's the right question. I think you should be looking forward, like what do you do next? Yeah, every teaching I've ever seen on karma says the causes and conditions are too complex. You, you will not draw a straight line from some imagined vision of the past to what's unfolding in this moment. Uh, but we're always, we're always training in something. We're always training our minds in something. And so there's always an opportunity. Uh, we, our first class was on the, the five lay precepts. And it, the, the whole thing was really about this idea, like every moment is an opportunity to plant the seed of something positive and to keep doing that. Uh, because we know that that will bear fruit. Um, 
even in just a, a kind of ordinary bounded way, but there's always this opportunity to be thinking, okay, how do I, how do I plant the seed of something positive here? How do I train in compassion? How do I train in love? How do I train in kindness? But yeah, this one's a really, I think this is one of those ones where our, our culture and the uh, original culture of this tradition just crash into each other. Yeah, it's really true because um, it's interesting to hear this kind of thread go through, which, which is embroidered with this quality of, of morality. But from the Buddhist point of view, it's all confusion. And so whether you're in a, 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 a favela in uh, Sao Paulo or uh, the Trump Tower, um, to the extent that you're disconnected from, you know, that you're confused by the nature of your own mind, you're, you're in the same boat. Um, and there's a way in which we, uh, we kind of reveal our own bounded view of the world by saying, you know, <clears throat> the circumstance is good or the circumstance is bad. Um, and so there must have been a bad, you know, a good or bad cause behind it. Um, I've always felt like the people that seemed the most unhappy to me were the really wealthy, um, who were especially those who were born into wealth. It seemed like a terrible, <laughs> terrible situation. Um, and just one last note on that. There's this wonderful, I think, Zen uh, parable that uh, there's two, oh, yeah. you know, the you, you can help me with this if you... So I'm, I'm going to make up kind of some of it because I don't remember as well. But there's it's two villagers, and one of them has a son. And his neighbor comes over and says, oh, it's such good fortune that you had a son. Um, and he, uh, he says, oh, it could be good fortune. It's hard to say. And then the son becomes um, a teenager, and uh, he breaks his leg. And so the neighbor comes over and says, oh, it's really bad luck that he broke his leg. And he said, well, it's hard to say. And the next day, uh, the country goes to war, and a person comes around to round, to round up all the young people, and he's got a broken leg, and he can't go. So the neighbor comes over and says, wow, what good fortune. Your son has a broken leg. So it's just kind of one of these things of uh, interpreting good or bad with not enough information is, leads you down a blind alley. Was that the one you thought I was going to say? Yes, but I don't remember it in any more detail than you yeah. do. Uh, Cynthia had something. So this is a slight shift away from karma. I think it is anyway. When I read this Thich Nhat Han piece, it seems so beautiful and it seems so right from an intellectual perspective. And then I ask myself, why don't I know this? Why do I forget every single day that I am new right now? <laughs> that is the nature of our confusion. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to come to a place where we experience that in a stable way that we see that doesn't it seem amazing though that there can be this very strong intellectual agreement and yet complete blindness totally that's my experience of working with karma like i still vividly remember sitting in the music room of my high school when i was 17 having been uh, raised devoutly a Catholic and uh, without having read any other points of reference uh, deducing reincarnation and deciding that that was what I believed uh, I believed that with strong intellectual commitment for what is that 35 years now uh, and when I think of the death of this body I f feel absolutely certain uh, that I will be destroyed and nothing will happen. Like, on an experiential level, I, I am totally attached to this thing 
and to the manifestation of personality that lives inside of it and totally does not mesh with my intellectual conviction so there's a there are two convictions functioning simultaneously and one of them is more powerful than the other <laughs> Yeah, and, I think that's common. And this is why we experiment with the uh, three uh, wisdoms, study, contemplation, and, uh, and meditation, because the experience, when we know something intellectually, the experience may not translate. And, and so yeah. we're trying to migrate that stuff over to the experience. Mm -hmm. We should stop and take a little break, uh, but did anyone have anything else they wanted to say about this reading or about the conversation before we shift? Are you regretting that you came, Bjorn? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. <coughs> All, right. All right, well, let's uh, break for about 10 minutes and we'll see you back here. And streamers, Linda's up to turn off the stream. So give her about 30 seconds.